بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So our speaker today uh, is Moina Shaikh. Shaikh, thank you. Uh, she is a resident of Fremont for 34 years, a uh, mother of four and a grandmother of two. Um, she serves as the Human Relations Commissioner for Alameda County. Uh, she is a founder of the Muslim Support Network and also the, uh, she serves as president of the Tri-City Interfaith Council and is a member or founder of the Meet a Muslim Initiative. Um, she has received several awards, uh, one of which is the uh, Council on American Community Relations Enhancing Understanding Award. Um, and this coming Saturday, I understand, um, she'll be awarded a as are named as the Woman of the Year for a California, California Assembly District 20. So, it is a great honor that uh, we have her with us. So please uh, welcome our speaker, Moina. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. This is a universal Muslim greeting. Whenever we meet, we say Assalamu alaikum, which means peace be with you. So I want to thank Tim Hart and Peter Freeman for giving me this opportunity. And I also want to thank all of you for being here this morning because no matter how much effort they put, if you weren't here, you know, we wouldn't still be able to do anything. So, like uh, Tim introduced, uh, I have been in Fremont for the past 35 years now. Uh, four beautiful kids, two adorable grandkids. <laughs> yes, they are adorable. <laughs> uh, my the oldest daughter, she's a licensed clinical social worker and she works with foster kids here in Oakland. Uh, one of my sons is a public defender for Alameda County. He was also in Oakland. He just got transferred to Fremont. And um, my youngest, she is uh, still in college. Both my husband and I have purchased our burial plots here, so we do plan to die here. Unless, you know, God has some other plans for us. <laughs> Been living our lives just like any ordinary American here in America for the past almost 38 years now. Um, I've been very involved in the community for almost two decades uh, doing a lot of interfaith work and you know when you are involved you get to know a lot of people in the community so I realized that anytime we do any interfaith event it's always preaching to the choir uh, the same faces are there no matter what you do how hard you try so when San Bernardino happened, um, I was actually out of the country. My mother-in-law was very sick and she was in Pakistan, so I went to visit her. And while there, she passed away. But after that, when San Bernardino happened, I started thinking, what can I do when I go back that I can reach to those people who do not come to our events? Uh, it's, it's like pulling teeth, basically, you know? So I thought maybe I'll just go and put an ad in the paper, go sit in a coffee shop, and if somebody comes, fine. If somebody comes, I'll take my laptop, do my work. But what I did was, in the ad that I put in the local paper, I put some questions there. And I said, no question is off the table. You can ask anything, and it goes to you guys, too. I won't be offended. And then I put some current events like, you know, what, why are women oppressed in Islam, what's the difference between Shia and Sunni, so people can get a feel of what kind of questions they can ask. So the first event drew 100 people. It, yes, it was, it was overwhelming. Like I said, I thought maybe a few people might just show up and that's about it. Uh, so that, and the good thing was over 90% were new people. Uh, they were not the same folks, so that was very promising. 
And since then, I have done about 56 events so far. I uh, started doing public, but now it's more like, you know, going to churches and schools and colleges, service clubs, even homes. People are inviting me into their homes where they will invite their family and friends. Because the thing is, even though a lot of people are aware of the issues, they have Muslim friends, there are times when they wonder too, you know, there's a question, why is it that people say they are so peaceful, but yet every day we see something negative on TV? And so it's hard for them to find the answers. So this gives them a platform. A lot of my friends come to these events because they don't ask me questions. They think they'll offend me if they'll ask me. But when they come to an event like this, this gives them a platform to ask a question. So, but I want to let you know that I'm a very big person. I'm filling very big shoes today. I know you guys have been, have had three scholars. <laughs> my predecessors, one of them is right here, Brother Rajabali. Um, mashallah, very knowledgeable people. So I'm, I'm a very lay person. So don't ask me too many quite technical questions. Maybe he might be able to answer, but I won't be able to. So just, you know, that's, that just got me started doing these media Muslim conversations. And I'm just trying to connect with people to show them when they are out on the streets or when they are shopping at Target or Costco and when they see somebody looking like me wearing a hijab, what do they think? What is this person like? What, what is going on in their heads? You know, just those kind of questions when you see somebody who's different than you. And, and for us, you know, uh, we are all over the news, people are hearing about us, so there are more questions to be, you know, on people's minds. So just making that connection is what I'm trying to do. Um, just so that people can talk to me, see me, have an on one conversation, because I think once you get to know people, then your image changes. Uh, a guy came to one of my events, and right before then, one of my stories appeared in a paper. He bought a paper in his hand, which was com all lines were highlighted. And <laughs> so when I saw that, oh my gosh, what, what kind of questions he'll have. So before the event, he asked me a question. And I said, you know what, why don't you wait? And we'll answer it in the whole group so everybody can hear it. That event, there was a lady there who completely hijacked the event. She constantly raised her hand. She constantly interrupted, made comments, asked questions. I could not get to that guy's answer question. And after the event, he barged out. As I saw him barging out, I ran after him. And I said, what happened? He said, you ignored me the whole time. You did not answer my question because you saw that I have this paper highlighted. I said, no, that's not the case. He said, you know what? I hate you guys. I didn't even want you to come to this. But I just came, just for the heck of it. And now I know that you guys are not right people. I sat down with him for 30 minutes, I talked to him, I answered his questions, and at the end of 30 minutes, he made my day. He said he has changed his image of Muslims. He said his dad at home hates Muslims also, but he said he'll go home and he'll talk to his dad and he'll try to change his mind. So just things like these really are very uplifting to know that we can make a difference in one person's life or we can change one heart at a time. Um, another incident, um, I was in Arizona doing similar stuff and this guy came and he said that he's a Korean War veteran. He has killed a lot of people during the war and he said he will slash my throat if I offended him. And he also said that he was armed with a knife. Now, I don't know if you know, but Cal uh, Arizona has open carry law. So going in, I was on the edge because not knowing if somebody in the crowd might have a gun and they can pull a gun at any minute. So I requested security from all the places that I went to. I said, please have somebody there who can keep an eye out. So luckily there was a police officer there and he came up to me and he said, this guy has a gun on him, uh, sorry, a knife on him and this is what he's saying. Should we let him stay or let him go? I said, you know what, just let him stay. And he stayed the whole time for a whole one hour. He stayed quiet. He didn't ask a question. He didn't disrupt. Very respectfully, he stayed the whole time. And then he left. I didn't go close to him. I didn't talk to him. But I hope in my heart that maybe, you know, the way he stayed there, he probably heard something or he will connect with something. Maybe not then, maybe down the road, he will realize. So just, you know, these are some of the stories that have been happening uh, in my line of work. 
So how many of you have been to the last three events that were hosted here? Oh, so the vast majority have been here. All right. Because I usually try to give uh, an Islam 101 in a nutshell. Uh, but you all know, you don't need to know Islam 101. Um, I will open up to question and questions if you guys have. I'm so glad you're here today, and you. we've been active, very much looking forward to hearing from women. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in, I have some questions about the hijab, the difference between the version where the face is covered and where it's not, and why yours is not, and what else has to be covered to be um, legal. Thank you, that's a good question. So, seriously, I didn't wear a hijab till about, I would say, a little before 9-11. Because growing up in Pakistan, there was, the culture was not. Women, my mom would not put us, even on her hair, she wouldn't put a uh, scarf or anything. So, I, when I came here and I started seeing women wearing a hijab, I thought this is an Arab thing. That's what was in my thoughts, because Arab culture is such that women cover up. And growing up in Pakistan, we did see Arab women. So I thought, you know, this is an Arab thing. That's why they're covered. Because I was born Muslim. I was not educated as a Muslim. I started learning about Islam when my kids were born. And then that's when I realized that I should be covering up, that this is not an Arab thing. Muslim women and men both are required to dress modestly. And modesty is subjective. I mean, it's everybody has their own view on modesty. So the, the, the thing that women cover their face, it's more cultural than Islamically. Islamically, we are required to cover from head to toe. Our arms should be covered up to here. Our pants should be, or whatever, covering to, on our ankles. So our hands can be free and our faces can be exposed. So that's more cultural than Islamic. So I just want to explain too that um, one of the beautiful things about being Muslim in this country is that uh, at some level everybody here has chosen Islam. So whether you're a convert like I am or whether you grew up Muslim either in this country or you uh, grew up Muslim somewhere else and then you came here, because we are a minority here, it would be very easy for people not to keep their faith. So when, when you see Muslims here, at, at some level it's because everybody said to themselves, this is my choice, this is uh, what I believe in, and this is what is best for me personally. And um, so similarly, with wearing the hijab, um, I mean, yes, I, I do believe that this is what God has asked from me to do, but at the same time, it's really about uh, a woman's relationship with God and not with other people. And so, um, you know, most of the women that I know who wear hijab, um, who didn't wear it from a young age, it's because they chose to do it. And often it's because, often they did it with their parents saying, oh, I don't know if that's such a good idea, or even their husbands saying, I'm not sure I want to be so public about my religion, you know, et cetera. So a lot of times people look at women wearing hijab and they, they see it as a sign of oppression whereas it is really the, the opposite. It's a sign of a woman's choice. And that's a good point, because when I decided to wear, my husband very much, was very much against it. He did not like me to wear a hijab. So like now it's almost 17, 18 years. He has accepted it, because you know he has no other way out. <laughs> but he still, if it was his choice, he still would not like me to wear the hijab. And my two adult daughters, they have chosen not to. Uh, and that's their choice because there's no compulsion in, his, in Islam. I cannot force them to cover. Why did he not want you to? Because I think growing up, culturally, he, he wasn't used to it. You know, and, and it's hard. Even when I decided to, it was not easy for me to make this decision. Because, you know, as a woman, we like to make up and hair and you know, all <laughs> that stuff. Yeah, so it was not easy. And I think because he was not used to it culturally, you know, when you're not seeing something growing up, it's hard to accept change. What was, what was the 
many original intention do you think that Muhammad had? Uh, Muhammad had yeah. a, about the hijab. I mean, was that part of his teachings, or so, was it just the modesty that kind of evolved later? So it was not him. It is in the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. God is asking Muslim men and women both to dress modestly, for men to lower their gaze, not to look in people's eyes, and. You have seen in Saudi Arabia and Middle East, men are wearing those long garbs, and so are women. When you look at Jesus and Mary, they're both wearing the long garb. Mary has a headscarf, but she's not tied so tightly. She didn't have to drive back then, right? So if I put it loosely, it's gonna fly away. So I have to make sure that it's tight. Uh, but that's been, that has been the culture throughout history. And so it's not Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that said that we should do it, God has asked us. Yeah, and then it just became the interpretation of the cultures. Right, right. right. So yeah. like, you know, in, in Afghanistan, in some places, they have asked women to cover up the whole thing, you know, the bulk of it, um, just some holes in the eye area. So it's all cultural. Those things are cultural. Yeah. It's just a minor question, but is, um, is it something you wear at home as well, or is it just when you're in public? And I get home, it's off. It's off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I have a third grade student who's got maybe two or three that I see, but I just wonder, is it like, sorry, it's like you've got a wide array for each, like, yeah. this matches so well with what you're wearing today. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to. The, ver the variety that you have. Yeah. So we do try to, but uh, we are not supposed, to, you know, we are not required to cover up in front of our own family members, like my husband, my son, my brother. Uh, so when I get home, I take it off. Um, but when I leave the house, that's when I put it on. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add, it's really interesting to me that, um, my name is Nasira, by the way. I've been Muslim since 1971. We came when I was 18 years old, before Islam was a bad word. Um, <laughs> It's really interesting to me that all your questions are about hijab. I know we're on the subject, but I'd like to point out that the hijab was revealed in the 20th year, three years before the Prophet Sallallahu died. That shows the importance of it. So for 23 years, Islam was being revealed, and the hijab wasn't revealed until three years before the end of the, uh, the time of the Prophet of the Revelation. So the real reason that we're Muslim is because of our belief in monotheism and the relationship that uh, an individual has with God to be a person who always is trying to figure out what the right thing to do is in a situation to be just, how to be sincere, how to be truthful, how to you know, gain peace. The first names of God is Rahman and Rahim, which means merciful in his being. He is mercy and mercy giving. That that's, those are his first attributes. Every time we say his name, we say those attributes. So while the hijab has become the flag of Islam and the burden of the war of Islam and the oppression of women, it really has a small role in terms of the, the meaning, the reason that we're Muslim. Uh, yes, it's very important for us to be modest, and I just wanted to correct one thing she said, men are allowed to look in the eyes of other men. <laughs> They're not supposed to look and study and, you know, glow into the eyes of women for reasons of, of modesty. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that. Thank you. So, I did have a, a question really um, related to that. So, in our previous three sessions, um, there's been some general questions about the treatment of women in Islam, uh, bringing up the fact that in Saudi Arabia they can drive cars and things like that. So, um, having heard the opinions of male scholars, I'm wondering, from your, I like, I'm interested in right. what your perspective is sure. uh, on that particular topic. Thank you. So Islam gave women the right to inheritance, to property, 1,400 years ago. It's nothing new. Women can, she, a Muslim woman is not required to change her last name after she gets married because her lineage is through her father, not her husband. A woman can work, but she does not have to share her earnings at her home because it's the men's job. Islamically, God has divided the jobs for both genders. And for men, he has to provide financially for the family. 
So if I work, I can choose to share my money, but I don't have to. So Islamically, his money is my money, and my money is my money. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> so, but of course, living here in America, when I was working, they had a joint account, and everything went into the same account, and you know, there was no separation. But what I'm saying is that is the right that was given to Muslim women long time ago. So, I mean, women have a lot of rights in Islam. Again, it's the culture. Mm -hmm. If you look at history, the first prime minister in a Muslim country, a woman, was 29 years ago. Mm -hmm. We still don't have one. Mm -hmm. right. you know? yeah. So, if women were not allowed to study, if women were not allowed to go outside the home and work, how could that be possible? Saudi Arabia is an exception to the rule. There are 50 predominantly Muslim countries in the world. Mm -hmm. It's one country that does not allow women to drive. Mm -hmm. Women are working there. It's not that they're not. I mean, they're doctors, they're teachers, you know, different jobs they are doing. But what we hear mostly is just Saudi Arabia. Pakistan, where I grew up, women were driving. They were going to schools, colleges. A mother is called an institution in Islam. So how will a mother be an institution if she's not educated? So education is very high up here. Islamically, God tells us that if you have to go across the globe to gain education, to gain knowledge, you should travel. So education is, and it's not for men or women, it's for both genders. So there is no differentiation that, okay, men go and study and women stay at home. No. Women and men both require, are required to gain education and knowledge and to study. Hi, um, I was uh, raised by a Southern Baptist father and a Presbyterian mother, uh, so I was raised Presbyterian, and um, over the course of my, because that was, you know, you did, uh, and then I went to university, and at university, we changed religions every year uh, within the Protestant uh, forum because there were opportunities to hear different speakers or different points of view or they were more into social justice or something. Um, and then um, as a musician, uh, we often become the religion of where our job is. Uh, again, within the uh, Christian sector. I'm very intrigued by those of you who uh, were not raised Muslim, uh, how and why you chose Islam, whereas for a lot of us, it wasn't really on the table very obviously. Mm -hmm. Right. It's kind of big. So since I was born a Muslim, I would defer to a sister or brother who converted here. Okay. Um, so everybody's experience is, of course, unique. Uh, in my case, I grew up a secular Jew and had, um, as is common for secular Jews, I had a little exposure to both Judaism and also to Christianity. We had the Christmas tree and the menorah. Um, you know, that whole, uh, you, know, have, you know, in some ways, a very American experience. I didn't really think of myself as looking for religion particularly. I went to school at UC Berkeley. I started meeting some people who, um, I wasn't really thinking about them being Muslim in particular because it wasn't really on my radar, but I started meeting some people who I just found to be like incredibly generous. I mean, that was the main thing that struck me as I thought, I had never met people who were so generous. And, um, and then I started asking more questions and I also was starting to realize that this was, it, it wasn't, a, oh, I happen to be Muslim and I happen to be generous. The, the two things were really tied to each other. And also, um, I remember, you know, so I started learning a little bit more, and I, I remember asking this uh, one uh, young woman uh, what she was planning and majoring in. And I was, you know, honestly, I was making small talk, like, I was just trying to think of something to say. And she told me that she was trying to decide what would be most pleasing to God. And that floored me, because at that time, um, I, I think I probably was agnostic, like I kind of thought there might be some force, whatever, but it didn't, it hadn't occurred to me that I could have a personal relationship or even to the extent that, that one could have a personal relationship that actually would help one in your daily life. And so I think uh, in some ways that was a turning point for me and I started studying more and um, 
and you know, doors opened for me. I guess that's the thing. Thank you. Can I, can I, can I have a one <coughs> Thank you. I just wanted to give another perspective. But you have reborn Christians, so there are many what you could call reborn Muslims, and I'm one of them. I was born from a Muslim family, but never practiced. I said that last time, right? So you will know. But at one point, I, I, I had an emptiness in myself. I had a very good life uh, from where I grew up in a small island of Mauritius. I came from a good family, so I had all the privileges you can think of. I was a musician, but I couldn't find happiness. I didn't have happiness. And that's when I started searching about religion, from Buddhism, Hinduism, you name ism. <laughs> I studied religion and I studied religion. And there was, I, I said that last time, I came down and I referred to the book of Novice Bukai, the Quran, the Bible, the science. I came down to that you can be only two religions. Uh, followers, either you're a Christian or a Muslim. And I went deep into both of those. And I studied the concept of God, the concept of sin, the concept of prophethood, the concept of salvation. And I went deep, deep into both doctrines and both scriptures. And then I made a conscious choice to be a Muslim. And I said, as long as I live, this will be my religion. So I just wanted to give another perspective that there are you can call them reborn Muslims if you wish, but there are many, many Muslims, uh, especially many of us growing in the West, they will lose Islam at some point of the, in their life, but then they will find it and connect it again. Is there a, term, like a, is there a term for that as in born-again Christian? No, Christian? we don't have any such term. There's no such term. I use the term so that you can relate to the concept. There's no such term. I use that same term too because growing up I didn't pray, I didn't fast, like I said I didn't wear a hijab. So I was, I don't, looking back I don't consider myself as a Muslim either. Um, back to the role of women. Um, I don't see many leaders in the Muslim world, in, in religion, uh, who are women. And I know that Christians cannot cast stones on that. <laughs> For centuries, that's been a problem. But um, I'm wondering if that's just kind of a de facto thing, or whether there is, is something within uh, tradition, within the Quran, that would keep you from becoming theological scholars. Actually, after the Prophet Muhammad died, his wife, his youngest wife, Aisha, who lived for about, I think, 50 or 60 years after he passed away. She was the one spreading Islam. She was the one who was leading conversations between men and women, teaching them about Islam, answering their questions. Because she had lived with the Prophet, and like we believe in the Quran, we also believe in the Sunnah, which is the life of the Prophet, what he did throughout his life. So there's a compilation of all the stuff, all the things that he said and the way he did. So we will, we have to follow both because he is our role model and the way he led his life, we follow that. So she was the one who was teaching men and women uh, back then, 1400 years ago. But again, most societies in the world are patriarchal societies. And it's not that there are any less women scholars, there are plenty of women scholars today, today especially, right here in America. But for whatever reason, men are morally, more in the forefront and women are behind. But Islamically, there, uh, God says that we will be judged based on our piety. So there is no difference in that respect that men are supposed to be scholars and teaching about Islam and women are not. That's not the case. So I have a, a niece, she is married, they have four children, they homeschool their children because they do not want any introduction of evolution into their studies. They're very evangelical, what we would call evangelical Christians. 
is how do Muslims, do, the, do your children go to public school? Are they introduced to science as we know it? Or are there, or are there people who homeschool? Either because of that reason or for another reason. So Muslims are the same as anybody else. So they are on all sides. There are Muslims who are sending their kids to public schools. And then there are some who are opting out and keeping their kids home and doing homeschooling. All of my four kids went to public schools. And then there are parochial schools. There are Islamic schools, where kid, private schools, where parents, some parents opt to send their kids there. So all spectrums in that respect. So there is, I mean, there is no hard and fast rule where which way you go. It's upon the parent's choice what they want their, for, best for the kids. Yeah. Kind of a, that engendered one question that has to do with whether or not the uh, parochial Muslim schools favor the voucher system that's being tossed around. Mm -hmm. And I would love to have the Muslims apply for those vouchers. Uh, if it ever comes to pass. But my other question was, in listening to all of this over the weeks, uh, this, these entities that call itself the Islamic State, but seem to be so antithetical to virtually everything you've said, how are uh, Muslims here counteracting that besides talking in these forms? Because it must be painful. Very painful, very frustrating. Because since 9-11 till today, we are on the defensive constantly defending our faith. Would you allow KKK to define what Christianity is? Would anybody in this room? No. I would not. I'm not a Christian, but I would not. Because I know what they are doing is cannot be right. No faith in this world would teach violence to hurt any human being. I mean, we are asked to offer our other cheat. Like I was talking about the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, all his teachings are along those lines. To be nice to your neighbors, to know your neighbors, to go visit the sick, to take care of the elderly, to take care of the orphans, to take care of the widows. I mean, where does it say anywhere in the, in the scripture or in the teachings of the Prophet? During the time of war, he would instruct his army not to cut a fruit-bearing tree. I mean, back then, the, there were wars were not fought by air or by sea. They were on ground. So when your when the army is going, you cannot cut a fruit-bearing tree. There's a story that there, he had a neighbor who would throw garbage at him every day. When he would walk out of his home, garbage would be thrown at him. <coughs> That for a few days, there was no garbage thrown at him, so he went and knocked on the door to find out what's wrong. What happened? Because it was every day that was happening. And so he found out that she was sick. He went and prayed for her. So these are the teachings that Muslims grow up with. The, te the, the stuff that ISIS is doing is completely contrary. I, I mean, they, how, why, would, why do we allow ISIS to define what Islam is? Yeah. They are not. Just like KKK is not. So, I mean, it's up to us, people of conscience, that we have to figure out that do we just go by what we hear on the news or do we find out? And, and again, like I said, we know for sure that no faith in this world teaches violence. But yet again, the Pope back then blessed the Crusaders. I mean, can you imagine the Pope blessing them to go and cause mayhem in the world and rape women and all that stuff? But whatever he read at that time, he justified it. So that's human nature. We are all human beings at the end of the day. Nobody's different. I mean, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, they're all the same in that respect. So people have their own way. I mean, the way I see it is if I have love in my heart, we, we all know that God is love. God loves all of us. And he wants us to reflect that uh, towards our fellow human beings in our daily interactions. So if I have love in my heart, I will look through that lens. But if I'm a violent person inside, I will look through that lens. Mm -hmm. And that's all. I mean, so much violence is happening in the world, not just by Muslims. 
a lot of plenty of non-Muslims. I mean, you look at gun violence. What's going on there? They're not a lot. Some of them are doing on, in the name of faith. Some of them are not doing in the name of faith. But it's just human mind. People convince themselves. They whatever comes to their mind, they work accordingly. You know, <coughs> they look at things that justify their thoughts. So it's it's not that Islam is. It's just those people are doing those things. It has nothing to do with Islam. Hi, um, I just wanted to firstly say that I really admire your patience in answering all these questions and stuff. Um, as a younger person, I have a, I think a different view on Islam than a lot of the, like many other Christians. Um, so I know a lot of um, Muslims in school, and I just don't really see that many of the differences right. that other people do. Um, but one thing I have a question about is, she brought up the teachings of Christianity about like. No evolution stuff. I was wondering what the Quran says about science because I've heard that it's pretty separate, like in Islam, like science and God. Actually, I actually science is proving everything that Islam treat, teach 1,400 years ago. So we believe that God created the earth and the human being. So if evolution is not something that we believe in. We believe that God created the earth in seven days, then he created Adam and Eve, and then he sent them down because they didn't listen to him, they didn't obey. So that's how life started on earth. Thank you. Can I add to that? Can I add to that, please? Yeah, as we look at it, if you make a deep study, especially in the Arabic language. Now, the word that Samoina use, use now, days, seven days. That's very biblical. But in Arabic, you will call it yom. And the word of yom is not day. It can be translated as day, but it could be translated as a long, very long span of time. And how you look at that is very different. Now, in my last presentation, I talked to you about the word rab very beginning of the Quran. The word Rab means somebody who creates something and takes that something all the way to its full maturity. That's evolution. Okay? So we don't have talk in Islamic school myself. I have no problem. Not everything that Darwin said, we agree. But Darwin must have read the Quran when he said life started in war. <laughs> and we have no problem. Right? But Darwin doesn't make sense. If Darwin makes sense, the Tina tip, the Rex should have still been alive. Because they were the fiercest and toughest of their of their of the generation. They should have still been alive. So we don't believe in Darwin at first value, no. But whatever he said is not foreign to the Quran. I gave you the book of Dr. Keith Moore. Go and read it, Google it out and check it. Dr. Keith Moore. Dr. Maurice Bukai. I talked to you about fingerprinting. To talk to you about Quran talks about we will go into the space. And I will think about that. And the Bedouin, when he heard that, he looked at his canal, he said, How is canal will happen? <laughs> right? But it is in the Quran, we'll go. Our sign, I said it last time. See, everything that science is, 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 is proving is already in the Quran. So the Quran is a scientific book, it's a very scientific. Islam has no problem with science. <laughs> We are, as a Christian faith, struggling with um, the way to open our doors and be welcoming to homosexuals and transgender people, and I wonder if there is a seat at the table for them in Islam. So like any monotheistic faith, the teachings are the same between Christians, Jews, and Muslims. But God tells us not to judge anybody. He is the biggest judge. Because we believe that if I'm doing anything wrong in this world, I have the chance to repent to God till the moment I die. So if before I die, if I make amends, if I ask for forgiveness, and if I have done bad things in this world, he is the forgiver. He, if he decides to forgive me, I might go to heaven, and somebody who has lived a very good life, who had prayed five times a day, I mean, in their own mind, they are doing everything right. Maybe that God might not like one of their actions, 
or anything, and they might end up in the wrong place. So this is just to give you an example. So God is the judge. We are not to judge any human being based on who they are. That's what I believe in. I mean, of course, there's differences of opinion. I'm sure people in this room might differ from what I'm saying, but that's what I believe. Hi, hi. Um, so I have a question relating to the question on the female scholars. It sounds as though both male and females are um, are allowed to pursue higher education. Mm -hmm. What about encouragement? Are females encouraged as much as males to pursue higher education? Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're raising your daughters and your sons, and you have a daughter who seems to have um, be good at science, would you encourage her to go to medical school as much as you might um, if you had a son with that same propensity? That's, it's equality. So both men and women are encouraged to pursue the career that they choose. There are plenty of women doctors. There are plenty of women engineers. My daughter-in-law is an engineer. Uh, my son, who has a three-year-old daughter, he refuses to call her a princess. He tells me, Mom, you're not ever going to call her a princess. I'm not going to teach her to be, you know, the typical woman model that a lot of societies have, have adopted. You know, pink and purple, you, you play with dolls, and you play with cars, and you, you are, you'll be an engineer, and she'll be whatever, whatever. No. Islamically, there is no such thing. Both men and women are encouraged to pursue the career that they choose. Yeah. I just want to add something, not add, but I want to introduce somebody that I think she needs to speak up. <laughs> I want to encourage her to tell about herself. So go ahead, Maheen. Well, firstly, I just want to thank everybody. We are very pleased to be here and to be among you all. It's, uh, it's, it's a very pleasurable moment for um, me and my family. So I just, uh, um, like my friend here, uh, Dr. Farida, she herself is a doctor. I just wanted to let you know, um, in answer to um, one of the sister's question, uh, by education, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, by profession, I'm a cancer registrar. My husband uh, here is um, a scientist. Uh, but we like to uh, keep ourselves humble. And um, you, uh, I have a daughter who has aspirations to become an astronaut here, and we totally encourage that. And her idea of taking a horse into space for her love of horses, we totally encourage that. And uh, like people say for college, my daughter's saving for a horse, and the horse will not suit. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's totally her. And my other one here, seven year old, she wants to be a farmer and a teacher, and we're all up for that. So, um, uh, th this is one thing that we. Uh, that uh, really attracts us and keeps us engaged within our religion is that it is all about education. Educate your children, educate your women, educate your men. Education is not specific uh, for anyone. And um, I have teachers, female teachers, like one of the uh, sisters, uh, uh, they, and they have Islamic scholars. Uh, I don't know if you have heard the name of uh, Dr. Rania Awad. She is um, medical uh, psychologist, uh, and uh, she's a fellow at Stanford. She has a PhD in Islamic studies, and she teaches. Um, then I have another teacher. Her name is, uh, and you can Google her too, because she used to be a software engineer. And, um, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm taking her name without uh, having her permission, but she used to work in the Bay Area uh, programming uh, video games. Mm -hmm. And she went to Egypt and got her scholarship from there, and um, she teaches. So um, if given chances, uh, like the one that we have right now, we would be more than happy to bring their teachers with us sometime. And you're also pursuing your studies. Yeah. She's being very humble. She's a student of those scholars, <laughs> full time student. <laughs> and this is not the exception. This is the norm. I? Well, I would definitely encourage you to invent a way to get, get courses in the space. I think that's your <laughs> I just want to add something to that. Um, 
I was living in New York when I first became Muslim, and there was a, on the front page of the New York Times, there was a woman holding her baby over a garbage can, and that made a very, very strong impression on me, so I really want to put a plug in for there's nothing wrong with devoting your life to being a mother. <laughs> This may have been addressed in one of the earlier sessions that I did not attend, but I'm curious about um, the Shiites versus the uh, Sunnis, and uh, they seem to be at odds, certainly not at peace with each other. Is there some unique uh, reason for that, and, and can you maybe expand on that a little bit for us? Sure. So the divide happened 1,400 years ago. <laughs> it's not a new divide. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he died, he did not leave a successor. So there was a group of people who wanted his best friend to succeed, and then there was another group who wanted his son-in-law to succeed. So it was a political divide at that time. So the Sunnis are the ones who wanted his friend to succeed, and they are 80% of Muslims. And the ones who wanted his son-in-law are called Shias, and they are approximately 20%. So the divide happened along political lines. The five pillars of Islam, at the core, both are the same. Both Shias and Sunnis follow the same five pillars. There are plenty of intermarriages in Iraq and, and other parts of the world where there are Shias and Sunnis. They were living very peacefully. Of course, during Saddam Hussein, he was oppressing. There were issues, but they were not at each other's throat like they are today. So it's, it's a lot of government and political factors that came into play. When I was growing up in Pakistan, my next door neighbors were Shias. We played together, we never asked. If we meet a Muslim here, a new person, I would never ask, or they would never ask, if I was a Shia or a Sunni. So th there's, there's nothing in, along those lines. We are, we are pretty much similar in that respect. So that divide is very political. And like I said, it happened 1,400 years ago. They were living peacefully. I'd like to follow up on your comment about how um, you don't want ISIS to define um, you know, Islam. Um, and you know, similarly, I would very much not like the current president to define how we feel towards, uh, towards Muslims. And so I'm, I'm concerned that um, the uh, executive order you know, banning um, you know, people from coming in from seven countries is validating the message of ISIS, say, aha, see, they hate us just because we're Muslim, so therefore they deserve to die. And um, is that a, a legitimate concern? And if so, what can we do to counteract that? That's a very good question. It is a concern because right now we are feeding into ISIS's narrative. We are giving them on a silver platter what they want for people to hate us, and that's exactly what we are doing. See, for us, most of us in this room, this is home. We, my kids were born here. Like I said, we have a burial plot here. We don't plan to move away. But today, we are living in fear. I mean, can you imagine living in fear in your own home, where you're afraid that somebody might tell you, go back? Where would we go back? This is home. We have no place to go back to. We are afraid to pray at uh, airports. I remember back in time when I, would, I was traveling, I would just go to a gate that was empty and I would go and pray in a corner. I'm afraid to do that. I'm afraid to carry a Quran or a book, a religious book on the plane with me because I might be kicked out. So we are in constant fear. And this administration has made it very, very easy for people to act on their hate. Like I said, the guy who said he will slash my throat. I've been living in America 38 years. I've never, ever heard something like this. I mean, two days ago, there was a Hindu man who was killed. So it's not about wearing a hijab or having a beard as a Muslim man or woman. Anybody who is a person of color, except for blacks, I would say, because I think blacks are accepted in American society. So it's basically white and black. Everybody else is a foreigner. So we, we are, I mean, I think today, for the first time in the recent weeks, I've started thinking that, am I a second grade citizen? Do I even belong here? But there's no answer, because I have no other place to go. So even if I don't belong here, where do I go? 
So this is this is a very very trying times for the Muslim community. Okay, so what what can we do to help? So what I this is a prime example of what you are doing. But as an ordinary person, I would say if you see a Muslim, give them a smile. Try to strike a conversation, because when you talk, you will find that people are very receptive. They will talk to you. You know. Whatever, you know, you have a nice blouse or your kid is pretty or whatever, any way you can, try to strike a conversation. That is the best thing, to make connections, to get to know people. Because like today, I mean, if I tell people to go online, there's plenty of online websites where you can get information on Islam. But you don't know how authentic they are. When I get questions asked, sometimes I go home to research, a lot of times this site comes up, it's called Jihad Watch. They make themselves sound like they are very authentic. They are the most hateful, bigoted website. So people, ordinary people, do not know. They're Muslim people. I won't say they are scholars, but they are Muslims who say they are scholars. They are very hate-filled. They, they are not preaching Islam the way Prophet Muhammad taught us, the way Quran taught us. Their Islam is very different. It's, it's completely on the opposite side. But for an ordinary person, it's hard to tell. Unless you go deep and see what the site is authentic, the writer is authentic, what are the thoughts of the writer, and all that stuff. So it's best to have these kind of events where you can meet people, you can face to face, and have a personal interaction. That's the most important thing. So that's why I started doing these events, just to go and humanize myself as a human being so people can see that I'm no different. If I take off my job, I'm the same. I mean, I'm still the same, but in appearance, at least, you look, people look at me as I'm a different person. So this is, this is all there is. I mean, just the ordinary level of human interaction to get to know your neighbors. Can I add something? Hi, um, I just wanted to add that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a high schooler, and I do face like Islamophobia and all that, but I do want to say that there are other communities, like, I actually think the black community is the most oppressed community in this, in this country. And, like, the Latino community is facing a lot of hate, and, you know, we're facing a lot of hate, but we're also getting a lot of support, and I think we should be supporting other communities as well. And so I really, I mean, I really appreciate, um, you know, us being invited here and all the support that we're getting, but some other communities aren't facing, aren't getting that much support as well. So I just kind of wanted to add that, you know, we should support all communities as well. Definitely, building coalitions. And, and the good thing of this administration is I want to thank him for bringing all of us together. <laughs> so, many, so many people have reached out to me, have sent me emails to my website. I have never met from across the country asking what they can do. They want to step up. They want to get out. They have never been active in the community, but now they want to get out and do some good, and they want to bring people together. So there's so much beauty in what's happening today. And thank you for your comments. Hi. I think just what you said, we're all trying to figure out what we can do. And I've been working with undocumented um, immigrants. And my question is, are there many undocumented Muslims who need support, and what kind of support is out there for them? So because Muslims fly into America, for the right. most part, they're not undocumented. <laughs> for the most part, I think I would say the majority of Muslims here. See, for our generation, we all came here to get higher education. We, like my husband came here, he went to college. So my generation, majority of people, came to the US to get higher education. And then there were refugees who came from Iraq and Afghanistan that came as refugees and got asylum. But they all flew in. They all they didn't cross the borders from Canada or in Mexico. So for the vast majority of Muslims, I think they're all documented here. But that doesn't mean much today, you know. Uh, they are not being allowed to get into the country. Day before yesterday, I heard that Muhammad Ali, the big guy in our country, you know, the, the boxer, his son was detained at the airport. Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, for five hours or something. Yeah. And, and so people, when the executive orders were signed right then, immediately people were started detaining at the airport. 
I mean, me and my husband have plans to travel end of this month. I was thinking, should we go or we should we stay? I mean, we have been U.S. citizen for the past 35 years. But I was concerned because I think legally I cannot be stopped from coming into, back into the country, but they can just give us a hard time. They can detain us for hours on. And, you know, if, you, if you're just going as a vacation or something, I guess it can wait. <laughs> So I want to I want to have a question related to that. Um, I travel quite a bit, and uh, one of the things that concerns me is if I were to go to a predominantly Muslim country, uh, like Indonesia, for example, um, how would I be treated there? Would the the fear that is that is being that Muslims are being subjected to here would that now be projected to me if I were to go there? So as long as you don't go to a war-stricken Muslim country, you have your white privilege. <laughs> Just like you have it here. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, people look up to people who are from outside of the country who don't look the same. And for the most part, they know when you're white that you are coming from a Western country, America or Europe, and they, they will respect you, they will take good care of you, they are very hospitable, but I would not suggest going to any of the war-stricken countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, all those parts of the world. But everywhere else, people look up, see the way they say here that those people hate our freedoms? That's the opposite. We came here for the freedoms. They love our freedoms. They love this country, the, what it is offering to, to people that are living here, the good life that we all have here. So that is actually the opposite in the Muslim world. They, they respected, they looked up to us. Today, I don't know. Seriously, after November, after our elections, I don't know what the mindset is in other parts of the world. But for the most part, people looked up to us. I just um, wanted to respond also to the, the what can we do to counteract the ISIS narrative, which, you know, it's been a challenge uh, for everybody. <laughs> um, it, one thing is, I mean, if I was a Muslim overseas, I think, you know, the, the generic Muslim overseas, things probably would not start shifting a little bit for me about what I think about America, particularly as so many people have... Um, come to the U.S. and then had difficulty here, or even these uh, you know, Indians who were shot, etc. Um, but at the same time, they also are seeing all of the patriotic, I would say, Americans who came out to the airports. And I think that um, vision, you know, images like that counteract the narrative that Muslims are being are hated by Americans. So I would, you know, I mean, my mom took me to some rally to stop nuclear war when I was a kid. I, I uh, you know, brought up, was brought up with a tradition of being an activist, and I, I do think this is a good opportunity for us to be very public about um, what we believe in. But I, I also wanted to um, think that perhaps, um, Brother Adjokman, you would want to say something about your Yes. So, um, in regards to uh, the sister said, in regards to um, you know a lot of the Muslims, I, I I do feel that we we do get a lot of support, and um, and when we went to the airport, of course you know um, the travel ban hit a lot of people. I personally had family that had visas, had green cards that were revoked. As soon as they came to the airport, they will they said your visa is report. These people have been living here for ten years. And so, but the, you know, the people that started the, the airports weren't, you know, like, you know, a lot of American people went to the airport. And it was amazing when you would go to the airport and you would find all those people, it was overwhelming, you know, for us as Muslims, you know, it was um, very warming to, to know that you would have that kind of support from these people. So um, I do think that we did get a lot of support and, um, and actually, I have a business in the Fruville district, so I, um, I work in the very populated Latino area. And so um, I, I'm having an event next week, Saturday, everybody's welcome to come, where we're going to invite some, um, you know, the mayor of Oakland, Barbara Lee, and some other officials to come and support the Latino community. And, uh, so
welcome. Everybody's welcome. Where is it going to be? It's going to, um, I'll give the address to Mary, Mary, Mary and then she'll give you the I, I just want to thank you so much for being here. And um, I, uh, uh, this is maybe a, an expansion on the question of what can we do. Uh, my sense is there's been uh, a concerted strategy by many people to criminalize all people of color. And this has uh, helped in some ways stir our, a new sense of community, as you mentioned. And uh, we as a congregation really long for deepening relationships. And uh, we experienced some of that right after 9-11 when we had a wonderful relationship with the Islamic Community Center. Mm -hmm. Hamid Mavani uh, uh, came here with the congregation and read from the Quran in a worship service. And we gathered together around our table and then we were invited to their prayers services. And we were, it was a, it was a, started a journey for a while. And that seemed to fade out. And, uh, Currently, I think, as a congregation, there's tremendous interest in deepening relationships. And uh, how do we, where do we find that? How do we, how do, we uh, do that? Um, and specifically, in, when approaching the Islamic Cultural Center, they have a relationship with uh, a, a synagogue and also the First Presbyterian, and they said that was enough on their plate. <laughs> so, even though we tried to put our foot in the door, uh, there was a feeling that um, uh, there was enough going on with that particular community. And I, I, I really hope we can find a community uh, of Muslims that we can not just uh, occasionally talk with, but deep in relationships sure. with, where we can really get to know each other. And where do you see that as a possibility? So there are a lot of interfaith circles everywhere. Uh, in fact, Oakland just started uh, Interfaith Council of Alameda County, but it has started in Oakland. Uh, and I can give you their information. So joining those interfaith circles is good. You get to meet people of all different faiths to deepen your relationships, to get to know. But for the Ma'at Mosque, what, see what happens is when the, in these trying times, like right now, Muslims are feeling very stretched thin, very overwhelmed because everywhere we are asked to come and speak and talk, and we want to. It's not that we don't want to, but there are so many of us, and there are so many of you. <laughs> <laughs> so like the question was asked, what can we do? Again, the thing is, you are all ambassadors. You have. Uh, followed these past three and today's the fourth series in the series. You are well versed now. You are well educated on the topic of Islam. So you go and spread the word. You talk to your family and friends and I'm sure you all know people who are a bit conservative or a bit ignorant about Islam because we can only reach so many people. We cannot reach everybody. So you help us spread the word. And uh, I mean, I know in Fremont, where I come from, we have been holding open house at the mosque for the past 12 years. Uh, we just started, we, finished, we stopped doing it four years ago because I was spearheading it there, and then I realized that it's again the same people coming to every year's open house, no new faces, no new people, so we stopped doing it. I mean, but we are always open for communities to come and visit the mosque if they want to. So feel free to contact Brother Rajabali or myself or anybody in this community if you want to go and visit a mosque or, or have a relationship. You know, these, this is how we build relationships. Thank you. Really, I really want to second what she just said, and also I think it's vitally important that you take responsibility on yourself to educate yourself. If you study the history of Islam during the um, 
Middle Ages, when you know the Christian world was in what they call the Dark Ages, it was the golden era of Islam, and you could find out about all kinds of things that will help you discuss with your communities, you know, what you've learned about Islam. Also, I think it's really important, and I didn't hear anybody say it, I really want to say it. ISIS is attacking Muslims. ISIS is to Islam what the Spanish Inquisition was to Christianity. They are burning Muslims because they're not the exact ideology. You could be Sunni and you could be killed by them because you are Sufi. You are not exactly, you don't accept their khalif. So the people who are really, the truth is that the Muslims are the ones who are being killed by ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda. So, you know, this is a huge misnomer. It's a huge false uh, presentation that the that other people, the Muslims, are the ones who are, have, have to worry about these groups. It's really not, their, their target isn't the non-Muslim, it's the Muslim. So that's really quite fascinating it's gotten uh, flipped like that. But anyway, I just would invite all of you to not sing to the choir, to go out and find out about Islam for yourself in terms of the arguments that are being presented against it, like we're, we're backwards, we're barbaric. If you find out about the contribution that Muslims have made to science during our golden age, it's unbelievable. Unfortunately, for whatever reasons, we have had a very um, dark period where there's been a lot of backwardness coming into the Muslim uh, world, and that's our problem. You know, and, and some people will say we brought this on ourselves. I'm not. I don't agree with that. But I think that it's really important to look at the golden era of Islam and find out what Muslims do, what they think, what they say, and what they've contributed to the world. To add to what she just said. It's very important for people to understand that any time an act of terrorism happens anywhere in the Western world, it's 24-7 breaking news. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Every day, Muslims are getting killed in Muslim countries. Every single day, and not in small numbers, in big numbers, hundreds. We never hear about it. So the media has a clear bias towards Muslims. So when the general populace doesn't know about it, they think that it's just that they are getting targeted. It, we are all in this war together. It's not them and us. We are all together in this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add my perspective to what you were saying. I really appreciate that because this year in school, more than I have in the past, I've been learning a lot about the history of Islam, and I found it really interesting. There was things I never knew, and I kind of blame that on American education, focusing on a lot of the Western um, accomplishments as opposed to other countries' accomplishments. Um, and I just wanted to say that I've been talking to a lot of adults that I know, and they have no idea, even though they're way older than me, all these things, like op optics and stuff, that like um, Islam has contributed, and like it's really changed my mind, and I really think, I really encourage everyone to go and look at it, it's just really interesting. So I totally appreciate what you were saying. And as Muslim, I don't know a lot of my own people's accomplishments, because again, we were not taught. History is skewed too. So we have to make effort to learn of what our history is. Yeah, I had just gotten back from India, and uh, I'm so impressed at like just seeing the mosques and you know the, the uh, temples coexisting peacefully. Right. And then a stop over in Abu Dhabi at the Arab Emirates, and going out and going to the White Mosque, and it was just like I felt safer there than I felt in coming back to America in some ways. You know, people were so gracious. My driver was from Pakistan, and of course he wanted to come to the United States, and I just kind of was like, well, this might not be the best time. <laughs> you know, but it was like the, the energy was so open and um, accepting and, you know, receiving. And there was that graciousness that I just so appreciated. And it made me very sad coming back here because I could suddenly see just the, uh, the bubble that we live in and the media and how much they propagate that consciousness and the division. And I really get how much it really is going to be our personal responsibility to uh, and use, as use travel as a political act, as Rick Steve talks about. Because if we don't um, interface with other cultures and actually realize how much we are being programmed by our media and have some understanding of that, um, it just you know, it's, it's that hatred within that gets projected out onto people that look different than us. So it's our personal responsibilities, and I think we can all be ambassadors for um, interfaith dialogue. Thank you for your comments.
comments. I mean, if we look around in this room, there are no identical twins here. Everybody's different. <laughs> we were not born into the home by choice, right? I was born a Muslim, you were born a Christian, or whatever. So we need to look at it that we were not given the choice, but yet we are all the same. Some people call some other name, but we are all the same. I wanted to respond to the question about um, you know, not, not being able to meet with the Islamic Cultural Centers as much as ideally, uh, you know, one might want. Um, so I, I go to a, a pretty small mosque um, near Children's Hospital called the Lighthouse Mosque. I think maybe the space is like half of this and, uh, you know, it can be um, pretty tight, but if it's hard for you to make it to Fremont and you, know, you want to come someplace a little closer to home, I'm sure anybody who wants to come would be welcome. Um, it's, uh, you know, most there are a few chairs, mostly we sit on the floor, so you can always squeeze a few more people in. And it's, it's a beautiful experience. It's a very inter-ethnic uh, community. Um, it's probably somewhat majority African-American people from all different backgrounds attend. And, and uh, they have different speakers. Um, you know, the, of course, the main service is the Friday service, which is at 1.30. And the speakers tend to have a great sense of the humor. Um, but there's also, if you look on the website, I guess there's probably, there's different classes and things like that if people want to come. It is true, though, that, um, you know, because we are a minority in this country, and then I'll, I feel, you know, personally, like, suddenly it's like, okay, I really need to get out there more, I need to be more public, I need to talk to more people, because there's so much misinformation about Islam. But it is tricky, right, because everybody, you know, I mean, I, um, I'm not by nature a public speaker, and I have a life, and I'm trying to, like, live it. Um, but I think everybody um, that I know in the Muslim community is trying to make more effort to, okay, okay, I've got to make it to at least one interview event. I've got to make it to at least, you know. But it does make it harder. Um, I mean, it, it would be a beautiful thing to have more um, ongoing, regular things. But I think this interfaith council that you're talking about is good because you could probably accept like a, a fairly <coughs> large group and it doesn't have to be um, the exactly equal numbers of the, the different faiths. Right. That is part of the challenge. Is, um, you know, trying to find uh, time in our day when there's, there's there are fewer Muslims, you know, to be out there as as much as it feels like now we need to be. Thank you. Okay, so it is one o'clock. Um, so probably have time for one more question. If anybody has one. I just wanted to add to the last question about what we can do together. Reverend, you answer your question. I think what we should do, I mean, if we said, like talking to the choir, we need to get outside the choir. I think what we can do is okay, identify some projects that we can work together. Projects like homelessness, projects like domestic violence, projects like the environment, projects like refugees, settlement. I think what we, you, you are doing your charity, we are doing our charity, whatever we can do, but we are not working together. For example, how many of you know, really, honestly, tell me, raise your hand if you know that the Islamic religion sent their uh, 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 volunteers in Sacramento the minute the, 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 the warning of evacuation was given. How many of you know that? I'm glad you know that. Only one. Right? But if we work together at the coalition, if we work together at the coalition on those projects, I think it can bring us together to work together on some common hopes, and that's what it's all about. We have our differences, we respect our differences, we have our values, but we can work on some common projects. Identify, identify some common projects, form a task force of all the, 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 the go with the women, whoever wants to go and go when we do. So before anybody leaves, I have some brochures in the back, right? If they're, yeah, outside. Yes. they're in the, yeah. they're, okay, they're on the outside. Please feel free to take any of those. Right, so I'll let you have the last one. Okay. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for being here today. I hope I was able to answer some of your questions. Uh, sometimes I feel that people have difficulty reconciling. I can see some people are nodding. Uh -uh. This is not what, what it is. Because here I am for an hour or an hour and a half, or my brothers were here for another hour and a half or so. But every day when you're watching the news, every single day, 24-7, you're seeing the opposite of what we are talking about. So it's hard to reconcile. And it, I can understand if I put myself in your shoes, I might have that difficulty too at times. But again, like most of us have said, please 
try and research, try and reach out. You know us now, at least the people in this room know several Muslims here, some local from this community, some from Fremont and other communities. Reach out to us. We would love to have a conversation, sit over a coffee or lunch or whatever, and answer any questions that you might have, or your friends. Like I said, I'm going to people's homes. Feel free to contact me personally if you have a group of people that you think can benefit from this kind of a conversation. Because again, not all come to this church and they're not here. I mean, people are not always open-minded. But sometimes you just say, okay, let's meet this person. I met her or I met him. And they have answers to some of the questions that we discussed last week or whatever. Just get them together and, and we would love to come and uh, have a conversation. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I'm also on Facebook. If you want to like meet a Muslim page, you will get to know other events because I always post my events on my page. So if there are more in the Oakland area or wherever you are from, if there are other events in that area, you can direct your friends to those. Thank you.